Ja, herzlich willkommen, liebe well, Teilnehmer. A warm welcome to all our participants and everyone listening. A warm welcome to the sixth Franco-German Energy Forum, entitled Energy Transition and Transsectoral Decarbonization, the Role of Hydrogen for Industry, Mobility and Electricity. I'm Jeanne Rubner and I'm Vice Chair for Communication at the Technical University in Munich, and it's my pleasure to navigate you through today. This year's forum is taking place online only. Nevertheless, we're looking forward to a day full of really interesting discussions on a very important topic. A big thank you to all our co-hosts. That's the Franco-German Energy Forum, the the Franco-German Office, sorry, for Energy Transition, the German Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs, the German Federal Foreign Office, and the Franco-German Office for the Energy Transition. So let's let ourselves be welcomed now, first of all, from Dr. Philipp Nimmermann, who is a State Secretary at the German Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Climate Action. A welcome to you, sir. You have the stage. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, I'd like to say hello to Director General Madame Mourlon, to Jennifer Morgan from the Foreign Office, from Sven Rosner from the Franco-German Office. And let me welcome you to the sixth Franco-German Energy Forum. It's the first time I've been with you. It's the first time that it's virtual, but I hope that we will soon meet in person. I'm also delighted that we have so many high caliber co-hosts today. And I'd like to thank all of them for their efforts at this point. The German Franco-German Energy Forum, it's sixth year now. It's been a pivotal constant factor in the energy dialogue between Germany and France. And it's very much thanks to you, Mr. Rösner, and your team at the Franco-German office. Above all, Ms. Pizzotti, who's been with your team for a long time now, we attach great value to this exchange and this project together with the French Ministry for Energy Transition. And we know that this is extremely important exchange and we know about the work you're doing as a liaison point and a platform for exchange between German and French players on energy transition issues. So we're going to have a lot of interesting speakers today. It's part of a series of major Franco-German top level talks this week. You'll be aware that yesterday, our Chancellor, Mr. Scholz, met the French president, Monsieur Macron, my minister responsible for the energy transition, Mr. Harbeck, and also French ministries were there. It was very constructive, very successful. A lot of energy issues were addressed. The energy markets in Europe was one of those important themes. And I think we should take that impetus with us to address the issues we have on our agenda. These are really turbulent times geopolitically. We're just seeing it now on our television screens, these atrocious scenes from the Middle East. Nevertheless, I think the great challenge posed by climate change should not fall off the radar. And hydrogen is an important keystone in decarbonization and the energy transition. Today, we want to discuss together how we want to ramp up the market for hydrogen, how we can speed up that process on behalf of our consumers and industry. There are some important questions there. What requirements are there out there? What applications are we seeing now and are we likely to see in 10 or 15 years? And what about the regulatory framework? to make hydrogen accessible. What role can France and Germany explicitly play within this and in an exchange with our European partners? I'd like to wish all of you some really fascinating discussions and a very informative and uh, event full of discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, State Secretary, for your kind words. I'm now going to welcome Sophie Moulon, Director General for Energy and Climate. Good morning, and, and thank you very much to Philip Nimmerman as well. I'm delighted to make your acquaintance on this occasion, and good morning to everybody. I'm delighted to be taking part in the sixth Franco-German Energy Forum in autumn 2019, 
I took part for the very first time just after I was appointed to my role as Director General for Energy and Climate. There was a meeting in Berlin, in person, where we were able to meet everybody. It was very fruitful for me, very, very useful to meet my German counterparts and indeed the firms that were involved in that forum. These are really very important events and they're very rewarding, particularly in person. It's good to have in-person meetings sometimes and also online conferences are very important and useful too. I'd like to thank the Franco-German Office for the Energy Transition, particularly Sven Hussner. The Franco-German Office for the Energy Transition is emblematic of our two countries' desire to forge close energies and cooperate in the field of energy despite our differences. As Philip said, Franco-German Office for Energy Transition is at the heart of the Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Climate Action and the French Directorate General of Energy and Climate, with offices on our respective premises. The Franco-German Office for Energy Transition was set up in 2006 to work on wind energy. It subsequently extended its activities to renewable energies and then to the energy transition in relations between France and Germany. It's particularly important and these links lie at the heart of Europe and have been a motor and driving Europe forward historically as well. It's very important and we need to support our energy projects and insights mutually, not just the two countries in isolation, but also in interchanges with countries across Europe and relations between France and Germany are crucial. It's a big responsibility to bear, but very important. Now we're looking at hydrogen today, a new technology, at least partly new. And we expect that it will really have a key role to play in the energy transition. It's important to compare our visions to see where there are differences, where there are legitimate reasons why there are differences as well. We need to look at how this technology will fit into our respective energy mixes and how the timetable will look as well. In order to attain our shared climate goals, we'll need all the decarbonized energy available while respecting national choices, and hydrogen is one of those technologies, provided that it is carbon-free. Pip talked about the general context, the terrifying crisis in the Middle East that makes clear all of the issues that currently face us in international geopolitics. And the war in Ukraine has also triggered a major energy crisis. And in the long term, it raised the question of how to strengthen our sovereignty and how best to guarantee low carbon energy at the lowest possible cost to individuals and to consumers. The good news is that Europe has managed to organize itself within this crisis and has demonstrated huge responsiveness and solidarity. But that's a new challenge for us. We've engaged in solidarity during the crisis, expressing solidarity to Germany by boosting our LNG terminals. Historically, we actually import LNG rather than exporting it. And I think we have responded well to the crisis. Now we need to look to the future. Across Europe, we have adopted strategy in the realm of hydrogen. In France, we have a hydrogen strategy that was released on the 8th of September 2020, prioritizing the use of hydrogen to decarbonize industry and intensive mobility. I'll say a little bit about that. We'll address it in greater detail in the rest of this conference. Our focus is on intensive mobility and on energy. We focus on domestic production of hydrogen from our low carbon electricity mix, which is made up of nuclear energy and renewables. That helps us to meet the objectives of combating greenhouse gas emissions and reducing our energy dependence. There are a host of uncertainties as to how the hydrogen market will develop. We think that talking with our European 
counterparts too, that the use of low carbon hydrogen will be of the essence that allows us to make rapid use of all our low carbon production capacity. And that is crucial at a time when the energy crisis calls for a rapid and massive adaptation of our economies. I don't want to go into all of the figures, but in France, our financial commitment is 9 billion euros between now and 2030 to help make Europe and France a leader in the entire hydrogen value chain. And that includes manufacturing electrolyzer components and equipping ourselves as best as possible to face the challenges of the future. Implementation of the hydrogen strategy has been a success. The volume of size of projects supported has been very significant. There's an IPCEI tender and a project was conceived in conjunction with Germany in this context, focusing on both the supply side and demand side for hydrogen, including innovation and research. We'll look into this in greater detail this afternoon. A few comments now looking to the future and how we think that the hydrogen network will develop. That will be vital in the long term across Europe. France's priority for the hydrogen network, and I think that this echoes that across Europe as well, is to deploy hydrogen hubs. So on a particular in a particular area where there'll be production of hydrogen by electrolysis as close to point of consumption as possible so that we can have hubs. We have hubs across Europe already, as the case in other countries across Europe. We want to focus on the link between consumers, producers and storage networks. And we note that in France, there's already around 500 kilometers of network that needs to be built. Now, we'll be looking at this in conjunction with decarbonization solutions for the main industrial zones over and above these hydrogen hubs. And in the longer term, the priority will be intra-hub networks and their connection to, the, to storage infrastructures. Developing the hydrogen transport network will constitute the second phase of the deployment of the hydrogen network for us. And in France, that will represent around 1,000 kilometers of network. Planning of subsequent infrastructures will, we think, be an issue over the coming years, given that the market is still developing. It's a little early to know exactly how the future will look. We need to develop the infrastructure, certainly. These are long-term projects, but if you look at the kind of infrastructure that will be required by 2040, we should perhaps take our time to ensure that investments are used most efficiently for France and for Europe. That will be done in France and with our neighbours. That's what we're working on with Germany, but also with Spain and indeed with the European Commission. And let me point out that France is involved in developing hydrogen interconnections in areas where this is indeed already relevant. For example, around the Dunkirk hub in conjunction with Belgium and the Netherlands. In addition, we are, for example, financing studies for the Mosaic project. And that links up Saarland in Germany and the Grand Est region in France, converting to existing gas pipelines to 100% hydrogen transport as part of a cross-border industrial zone. Now, I think we'll have an opportunity to talk about import strategies in the course of today as well. It will be interesting to look at this because to meet all future needs for hydrogen, we need to plan now. But there are a whole host of uncertainties and there are studies diverge in their conclusions about the need to import hydrogen. It's too early to say that the cost of imported hydrogen will be particularly advantageous vis-a-vis -vis the cost of hydrogen produced in Europe, because on the latter front, costs are dropping rapidly. So we need to talk about planning as we look to 2050, 2060 for all of this additional infrastructure that will be required. 
Thank you very much for giving us an opportunity to discuss all of these topics today. They're very important as we look to the future. And thank you for this opportunity to welcome everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, General Director. This was very intriguing. And we're going into the day with lots of interest. Uh, thank you for your presentation. And I'd like to give the floor now to Mr. Oliver Rentschler. Director General for Climate Diplomacy and Geoeconomics, uh, the German Federal Foreign Office. Mr. Rentschler, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Mrs. Mourlon, Under Secretary Nimmerman, Mr. Rösner, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Mesdames et Messieurs, it is a great pleasure for me also to welcome you this morning to the Franco German Energy Forum. And uh, like the two previous speakers, I also believe that in these difficult times, uh, it is uh, more than ever important that Germany and France align themselves. And with all these uh, geopolitical crises, we also have the climate crisis, which is one of the big topics uh, in uh, German, uh, Franco-German uh, cooperation. And a few weeks ago, we had the COP28 uh, in uh, the United, we will have them in the United uh, um, Emirates. And uh, we will have an ambitious climate uh, package, and it'll be key to success. So I believe that uh, this topic of this forum today could not be more topical. And uh, if we want to reach these targets, it'll be very important that Germany and France cooperate, especially since uh, we sometimes have a difficult approach to climate action, which is why this bilateral exchange is so important. Because at the end of the day, green transition will only be possible if we do it together. We need it. Uh, there's no alternative. I think that is uh, needless to say. But if we did need any more undermining, then we can see that the International Energy Agency has uh, now just published uh, a roadmap, Net Zero 2050, with a very clear message. We do not need new investment in fossil energy like coal, oil and gas to have a secure energy supply. But we need a very quick global ramp up of renewable energies and uh, better energy efficiency by 2030. So we're on the right path and we need to accelerate this. Uh, that is undeniable. And hydrogen will play a crucial role here. That is also clear. It's also an important topic. Today, this will be the central technology of the future. In uh, Germany this year, we published or uh, updated the national hydrogen strategy so as to have the right regulatory framework. We want market ramp-up. We're also giving messages to the private sector, and uh, we want to contribute also to climate action by this. Two things will be very important. Uh, clearly, hydrogen is crucial for climate-neutral uh, economy in the future. And uh, from the German perspective, at least, uh, it's going to be clear that these large amounts of hydrogen will not be produced in Germany alone. So ideally, and Mrs. Mourlon has already said this, uh, we will have to work in a European framework, but maybe even beyond that. So then we will enter partnerships, uh, we need uh, reliable supply chains, and we will have to negotiate uh, with all geopolitical implications. So we will see major changes in uh, trade uh, uh, fl flows, we will see new stakeholders, new actors, um, and uh, we will have to set the course now correctly. We need a stable, fair supply network, and we should avoid the mistakes made in the fossil era. The German Foreign Office, uh, to best, better understand this, uh, two years ago initiated uh, the hydrogen uh, diplomacy initiative so that we have a fair contribution globally speaking and when talking about partnerships we mean that both sides will mutually benefit from this so you have export uh, perspectives towards germany and europe but you also have local value added and uh, i think that this market ramp up and these efforts 
are, is something Germany and France can do together. Of course, we're also talking about infrastructure. Mrs. Morlan has uh, told us uh, exactly what uh, she thinks about this. And uh, I think we also have uh, good possibilities of uh, cooperating. Of course, the pipeline H2 Med will be central to this. We need the extension to Germany to connect infrastructure and uh, we can then shape common binding standards for the European hydrogen industry, and this will be a keystone to climate neutral energy supply on the continent. Like in other areas, Franco-German cooperation will be of crucial importance uh, so that we have cross-border European hydrogen industry. Our energy and therefore also economic systems will have to be made viable this way. And uh, it seems only sensible to have this discussion today. So I'm very happy to see so many people committed to this in Germany and in France. And uh, it's very good. They should all contribute to the Franco-German tandem, making a contribution also globally towards the global energy transition. And I wish you all a very fruitful exchange and uh, have a good discussion today. Thank you. Thank you very much for those comments. And I'd like now to hand over to Sven Rösner. He is the director of the Franco-German Office for the Energy Transition. Go ahead, sir. Thank you. Mr. Nimmerman, Director General Morlan, dear Sophie, Director General Rentschler, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, thank you. And welcome on behalf of the Franco-German Office for Energy Transition We're at this sixth Franco-German Energy Forum. We're delighted to welcome you here today in conjunction with the German Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Climate Action, the French Ministry for the Energy Transition, and the German Federal Foreign Office. We're pleased to be alongside them as co-organizers. So we'd like to welcome you. The French and German governments have met in Hamburg over the last two days to discuss questions that are fundamentally important in a trust-based climate. And that is a particularly important ambience because that is rooted in the close friendship between our two friends, also in the realm of the energy transition, its importance for Europe. It's a key factor for the success of our society's cooperation between France and Germany, particularly in reform of the electricity market, as we heard yesterday at the press conference, has been identified as a crucial criterion in making our economies competitive. And we hope that we'll be able to discuss today on the basis of that spirit of cooperation. Today, we're looking at hydrogen, a topic that we've taken on board since this summer for quite some time now, hydrogen has been seen as the building block that is missing in the energy transition and thus the missing element when it comes to efforts to mitigate climate change and global warming. It can help to establish links between various other energy sources and their challenges to establish an integrated system. So it's really a cornerstone and it will hold up the entire structure. So clean hydrogen can decarbonize industry, replacing steam reformed hydrogen or coke. It is a way to make the electrical system more flexible making it possible to store surplus energy. And it's also been studied to fuel HGVs and diesel trains, sometimes in the form of synthetic fuels, and has recently been suggested as an option for heating in accommodation in Germany. So it's a real all-rounder, a multi-talented Swiss penknife, one might even say, this small molecule a magic formula in a sense. And it will be very helpful for us as we seek a solution to climate change. We're going to look at its different 
uses today and ask about the role that hydrogen can play. There's 70 percent in our universe. That's striking, but it's actually quite difficult to capture it in a fashion that is neutral for the climate. It's difficult to concentrate in a form that makes it possible to use it subsequently in all those various different uses that we cited. Many of you will have been at our hydrogen and electricity system conference in 2021. And you'll remember that everyone was very enthusiastic about hydrogen at the time, which was described as the champagne of the energy transition. Some thought it should be kept for special events. Actually, a great deal has happened since then. But if we're still talking about hydrogen in the conditional tense today, it's because we need to get to grips with the challenges, the options that this molecule offers are something that everyone agrees about. But the electrolyzers that we need to isolate it and to concentrate it are not yet available at the appropriate level across Europe and around the world. That also goes for the infrastructure and the requisite market for transport and trade of hydrogen. And we need to change strategy to obtain the hundreds of terawatt hours of additional energy that will be needed to attain this goal in microeconomic terms. It is a huge positive development because every challenge, of course, also brings an opportunity with it. The difficulty, though, is at the macro level. Everyone is bustling for hydrogen as we move towards decarbonisation. There is thus a risk that different players will have different approaches to hydrogen. Now, those of you who've been at this forum previously and have, are, are familiar with our office will know that we're great fans of Fontaine. It's a little bit the situation that we currently have, like a two coats head on on a narrow bridge, each focused on their own priorities and convinced that they're more important than the other goat, each one trying to force their way across that small bridge of the energy transition, the way towards a decarbonized future. Now, in the fable, of course, both of the goats are going to come tumbling down for they are not able to cooperate and cross the bridge one after another and attain their initial objective, which was not to be right, but to get to the other side with their feet dry and without tumbling off the bridge, to get to the other side where the grass seemed greener and hydrogen more abundant. There's not a win-win situation in this fable from La Fontaine, perhaps only for the reader who enjoys the fact that he or she, of course, would not have acted like those two goats. The reader can say, well, I would have cooperated and wouldn't have ended up in the stream, running the risk of getting dirty and wet, and perhaps breaking a leg even, and perhaps it would be a good idea to be on good terms with the other goat, because we are, of course, stronger when we all pull together particularly if the wolf emerges on the horizon again. And the reader of this fable is, of course, quite contented because he or she will have got the message. So the energy transition is a project which affects all of the economic and societal factors of our world. It is very important in terms of sovereignty which means solidarity as well between citizens, firms, nations and continents. It's not possible to be successful by going it alone. It only works, as La Fontaine points out to us, if we understand each other, cooperate and compromise between partners. As President Macron and Chancellor Schultz reminded us yesterday, we are delighted, ladies and gentlemen, in that spirit that you are online with us to engage in dialogue on the energy transition and transsectoral decarbonisation to look at the impact that hydrogen can have 
in developing industry mobility and electricity. Thank you to everybody who has contributed and who will contribute in the course of the day to making this conference a success. I hope you have an interesting and constructive day. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Mr. Rosner, for your words and for your inspiring words. Before we take a closer look at this little molecule in more detail, let me point out a few technical points that are important for our virtual conference here. First of all, I'd like to ask all our speakers to speak slowly, to avoid acronyms that will facilitate the work of the interpreters on streaming channels and enable them to make things heard appropriately at the other end. We'll be able to see in a moment that the website will be publishing your presentations in about a week. So don't worry if you've missed something because you'll be able to read up on it in three languages later on and certainly listen to the streaming recordings in all three languages. You can ask questions. If you want to do that, please use the module on our streaming site. And now, I'm looking forward to the first thematic complex of the morning, which is hydrogen as the keystone of decarbonization. I'd like to most warmly welcome Dr. Timo Gül, who's responsible for energy technology at the International Energy Agency. For those of you who are aware of the World Energy Outlook, of course, you'll know all about this. And he plays an important role in providing statistics, outlooks, and so forth. So we're delighted to have Dr. Gul with us. You're going to be talking about the requirements, the needs, the costs, the potential, the limitations of hydrogen in decarbonizing the European energy system. So you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Rubna. And first of all, let me say good morning to all the participants. I am really pleased that I can be addressing you on behalf of the International Energy Agency. At the IEA, of course, we have addressed hydrogen in a number of publications. You've already mentioned the World Energy Outlook as a key energy technology. And there's another publication I've been co-responsible for, which is Energy Technology Perspectives, which addresses these issues of new technologies in detail. Every year, we also have a global hydrogen review. The last one came out at the end of September. So what I'm going to be discussing with you in the next few minutes is very up to date, actually and is derived very much from that global hydrogen review. First of all, I wrote my PhD on hydrogen. It's more than 15 years ago now. But even then, hydrogen was regarded as an energy vector of the future and one that would always remain important. Now, things have changed a lot these days, hydrogen are now recognized as an important factor in achieving climate targets and in guaranteeing energy supply. Europe at the moment is at the front line if we're talking about developing a market for hydrogen. The 16 European countries and the European Union have already adopted a hydrogen strategy. France issued a plan back in 2018 with a strategy for followed by a green hydrogen strategy in 2020. 
this year, Germany updated its hydrogen strategy of 2020. So there's a lot happening, including in this Franco-German space. Europe is playing a leading role in research into hydrogen technologies and is responsible for almost 30% of global patents between 2012 and 2021 in this field. And in terms of electrolyzers, Europe was last year second only to China with 30% of global investments in the field. We can see on the next slide, I'd like to point out here that despite all these efforts in Europe and indeed in the rest of the world, Europe's no exception here, the chemicals industry and refineries have tended to be in the focus. Where fossil fuels are obviously used intensively, and that's not going to be sustainable, we're all aware of that. So 900 million tons cup of t carbon emissions are associated with that. If we look at UK, Indonesia as well, this is clear that it's not a sustainable energy carrier, and that needs to change, which means that by 2050, according to our calculations, Europe will, in order to meet its own targets, uh, have a huge demand, more than 50 million tonnes of hydrogen based on electrolyzers, and will also require imports to achieve this. This relates, of course, to the use of fuels like ammonia. According to our analysis, there is no way around that if we want to make broad use of hydrogen. But hydrogen, it's important to say so, is not a panacea. It's not going to heal everything. The idea is to reduce emissions in those parts of the energy system where other abatement measures are either expensive or difficult to achieve technically. Electrification is quite clearly the prime approach. According to our analysis, in 2050, hydrogen will achieve, account for only 7% of overall end energy consumption in Europe. That's total final energy demand in Europe. And it plays an important role in decarbonizing long distance transport as well as heavy industry. So it already accounts for more than synthetic kerosene will play an important part in aviation. Ammonia, methanol and hydrogen by 2050 together will account for about 60% of energy demand in European shipping. And that can be achieved. And it has to be if we're to achieve the climate targets. If we look at the next slide, you'll see that the interest in hydrogen is huge across the world. If we look at only the projects so far announced for producing hydrogen with electrolyzers, we can see that there's been a huge rise in recent years in the number of projects and that the geography has been spreading. So about 14 gigawatts of potentially installed capacity have already been committed to. We have seven megawatt installed so far. We are expecting another two gigawatt this year. But the expectation in terms of installed capacity on the basis of what has been committed so far is 14 gigawatts across the world by 2050. That's four gigawatts for Europe. So that means that either we're talking about the ones that have either already been constructed or are already in the pipeline or FIDs have already been issued. And you can see from the map here that a lot of this is concentrated in China and Europe. China has already committed to many one megawatt projects which could actually be up and running by 2030. I think you can see visually that Europe has made many commitments to these projects, but they have much lower capacity, with some exceptions, such as the hybrid project H to Green, steel project in Sweden, and Netherlands, the hydrogen project. In the Middle East, you can see that too, there's a much lower number of commitments to projects, but it's important to point out here that the neon green project in Saudi Arabia is the world's biggest project with two gigawatts of electrolyzer capacity. That was already being committed to. If we look at the next one, you can see 
and, and we look at all the projects which are currently not only already commissioned or currently being built or have been subject to a an investment decision, but everything that is in the conceptual phase at the moment as well, you can see that many more countries are already involved. And we have a much greater diversity of background. So a Europe still accounts for about a third of this pipeline. But there are projects being developed in many other regions of the world too that have positive resources for renewables like Australia and Latin America accounting for about a fifth of these announcements, followed by Africa accounting for about 10%. So all together, the project pipeline accounts for more than 500 megawatts in the coming years. But as I said, many of them are only in the conceptual or planning phase at the moment. If we look at the next chart, you can see that hydrogen output based on electrolyzers is not the only way forward for producing low emission hydrogen. Fossil fuels with CCUS, with carbon capture, utilization and storage could play an important role in ramping up low emission production of hydrogen. If we look at the CCUS projects currently underway, we see that hydrogen is a major application. For CCUS, hydrogen production is an attractive option. More than a quarter of the CCUS capacity currently being planned or implemented is somehow related to the production of hydrogen or ammonia. Overall, the annual production of low emission hydrogen can be achieved using one or the other of these methods, that is either electrolysis or fossil fuels with CCUS. This could achieve 38 megatons, 35 by 2030. Altogether, at the moment, we're producing 490 million tons of emission, low emission. These are huge project sizes. This isn't just our outlook. These are projects that have actually been announced across the world. If we look at the geographical distribution, we can see some considerable differences. Electrolysis, as I mentioned before, is favored by many countries, followed by fossil with CCUS. But nevertheless, we're still talking primarily about North America and Europe, with North America responsible for about half of the projects announced, and Europe about 40% of them. If we look at project status, we can see that the projects announced, and these are ones where at least a final investment decision has been made, only account for 4% of projects. So we're still a long way removed from achieving those potential 38 million tons of low emission hydrogen. Only about 4% of these projects have already achieved that final investment decision stage. And if we look at how great the impetus is at the moment for hydrogen, that doesn't sound very impressive, but it's not really very surprising. We have to expect this kind of thing in a sector which is at a very early stage of development with and has to develop complex supply chains and is confronted with turbulent supply situation, a lack of regulation, and in many cases, a complete lack of infrastructure. And those hurdles are matched also by rising costs and uh, the hesitant implementation of political decisions, let's say. If we look at the next chart, I would nevertheless like to stress that the progress being made with electrolysis is an important indication that we have the development of an emerging sustainable economy here. And we've been observing this at the IEA for a number of years. We're talking about the production of solar modules, e-vehicles, batteries, and so forth, but also the production of electrolyzers. An important indicator here is the production capacity for making these electrolyzers. According to our figures, the global manufacturing capacity for electrolyzers by the end of this year could already be almost 20 gigawatt. 
That's more than twice as much compared with the end of 2021. Half of that capacity, as you can see here, is based in China and Europe. Uh, in China, and Europe accounts for about a fifth. If we look at the announced projects, as you can see on the left, we look at the manufacturers involved and the manufacturing capacity we can expect to see from those, we'll see that by 2030, if all these projects are indeed implemented, we might be achieving almost 160 gigawatt of manufacturing capacity per year, which is 90% of the capacity we need, according to our analysis, to achieve global net zero by 2050. China remains the greatest source of manufacturing. But if we look at the announced projects, we can see that its role will not be as great, less than 25%, because there are a lot of other countries too, Europe, the United States, India, also planning to step up their manufacturing capacity. So Europe will maintain a 20% contribution here, although the absolute manufacturing capacity in Europe will multiply sevenfold by 2030. This manufacturing capacity in Europe will be almost enough to achieve the expansion targets for the UK and Europe together by 2030. That's for electrolyzer capacity. Whether, of course, all those plans bear fruition, we don't know. It's not guaranteed, because implementation will depend on a number of different factors. As we can see here in the middle, First of all, only 20% of the announced assets for 2030 have so far not identified a location. So industry policy measures can play a big role here in developing domestic capacity for hydrogen. That will be the IRA of the Inflation Reduction Act in the USA. There's a plan for India as well for electrolyzers. All of these things, the implementation of all these measures and announcements will influence the actual capacity ramp up and will influence where exactly these assets are built. But we can see that 90% of the announced manufacturing capacity has at least achieved financial investment decision stage or are already being constructed. Whether at the end of the day, by 2030, they are actually available to manufacture, we will have to wait and see. If we move on to the next chart, you'll see that the production of low emission hydrogen is obviously under the strain of inflation and other cost impacts. Inflation has exacerbated the situation over the last two years. Inflation has contributed to increasing the prices for energy and other inputs, and that has affected the economic feasibility of many of the projects that we've been looking at. An analysis in the middle of last year showed that many of these project developers had had to reassess their costs, and many had actually corrected them upwards by 50%. There are a number of factors that play a part here. For one reason, the cost for electrolysis has considerably increased because of the cost of materials in recent years. So the cost for the electrolyzers increased about 9% last year, year on year. Secondly, those cost increases relate to the costs for renewable energy sources, just as photovoltaics. And the if we take those costs together, the production costs for renewable energy costs could increase by about 20% compared with 2021. The biggest cost increase, of course, comes from the increase of capital costs. And renewable hydrogen costs require a lot of capital. They are cost intensive, and even a 0.3% increase in those costs can have a sensitive impact on the costs of those projects. If we compare the production costs with those of other renewables, we 
we can see that this is having an impact, for example, because of restricted public budgets. And so it's not likely that these cost increases will continue in the long run. They are already ebbing away. So maybe by the middle of next year, we'll start to see sinking costs. But for projects already in the planning stage, that does mean that the major impact inflation is not going to mean that projects are entirely relinquished, but certainly investment decisions will be delayed. We come on to the next slide. I would like to dwell a moment on the competitive situation in the industries concerned. This chart comes from our publication, Energy Technology Perspectives, from the beginning of this year. The competitiveness of existing and new industries is a major political concern, and that means that we have to look at the relative strengths and weaknesses of these different technologies. Access to low-cost energy resources is a competitive advantage, because that leads to low energy and production costs for a number of these components. Those competitive advantages are not going to disappear completely over the year. But hydrogen is a very good example, because typically, as I've already said, it's produced from natural gas and coal with costs of one to three dollars per kilogram. So hydrogen from renewables is still expensive. I tried to explain that just now. The manufacturing costs could, if the market is successfully ramped up by 2030, fall considerably with the overall impact of falling costs for renewable energy and electrolysis, which could mean that cheaper energy from these sources will become competitive with fossil-based electricity, even without subsidies. The point is that gas and oil can be produced more cheaply in some countries than in others, and that leads to considerable cost differences, especially in costs for renewable power. We've carried out some detailed geographical analysis, which showed us that the manufacturing costs in 2030 in countries like China, India, and the United States could be considerably lower than in countries such as Western Europe or Japan. Of course, that will have an impact on the industrial inputs that can be made available and at what cost, such as steel. Europe at the moment is playing a pioneering role in developments with steel production with much lower emissions using hydrogen in the medium term. Europe and other regions with higher costs for the manufacture of hydrogen will need to maintain their innovative competitive production, and they can only do that if these factors kick in in the long term. But we shouldn't forget that other countries in the market may start to compete for these low or no emission commodities. So that market advantage for Europe will not always remain. Costs will remain a sensitive factor. And these are fiercely fought over international markets. Costs will remain an essential factor. If we come on to the last slide, just to wind, wind up perhaps a few words on trade with hydrogen. As I said at the beginning, Imports may play an important part as an option for Europe, especially bearing in mind the current situation. International trade with hydrogen is at a very early stage still. Ammonia and methanol are traded as commodities for this industry, but the trade in hydrogen itself is not currently restricted to very few pilot projects. Global efforts are being stepped up. Germany introduced its H2 Global ca campaign last year, looking at hydrogen, hydrogen derivatives. And our analysis show that export-oriented hydrogen projects have been announced, which up to 2030 could lead to a trading volume of 16 million tons of hydrogen if all of them are implemented. So more than 40% of global production of 38 million tons if we take all those low emission project announcements together. And that clearly demonstrates we feel that the potential export is going to be an essential factor in developing hydrogen projects 
worldwide. If you look at the distribution here, you can see that about half of these projects are planned in Australia because it has excellent basis for renewables and is close to the Asian market. Uh, on the import side, we see that about a third, that is most of the announced projects, are based in Europe. And about half of those import projects haven't yet identified a target country, which means that we are talking about a very early phase of this development. Most of these export projects make a priority of transporting hydrogen in the form of ammonia, as we can see on the right-hand side. In some cases, we're talking about a direct use of ammonia to avoid energy loss through reconversion. For example, the use of ammonia in the fertilizer industry, um, use of ammonia in new requirements, but also this is important for aviation. If we look at the current development stage of these planned projects, more than three quarters of them are still at a very early stage and only a quarter of them have achieved feasibility study stage. So, and so far, only about a third of those projects have identified a potential off-taker. Very few of them, less than a third, have identified a potential, uh, have got to the investment decision stage. So a lot remains to be done in, in developing this global hydrogen market. And I think I will leave it at that and hand the floor back to the organizers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Gull, for that fascinating analysis. We've got a number of questions in the chat. Let's start with the question as to whether there are estimates as to when hydrogen and hydrogen derivatives will be able to make a contribution to heating of buildings. Well, the question of the use of hydrogen in buildings it has been very controversial, particularly in Germany. I did say before that the way we see it, hydrogen ought to be used in places where other technology options are not really available or where the costs of the technology would be a lot trickier. And buildings are not really the candidate here. There are several options available. Heat pumps are important. And in our scenario, which I think is now globally the benchmark scenario for a transition until 2050, for net zero emissions by 2050, the very low contribution from hydrogen that we had this year in buildings, I think we've reduced it from less than 2% in our first edition two years ago on the roadmap of the overall energy consumption of the building sector. We will have reduced to zero by then because there, we can't expect any um, advances in terms of the technology and quite the reverse. The steps towards using heat pumps in very many countries is moving ahead quickly. So from that point of view, there are estimates of what could be done and what role could be played, but in our scenarios, it doesn't really play an important role. Okay, well, then there's another question from the chat, which I think follows up there, or a comment or criticism. Hydrogen, says the participant, is a kind of fig leaf uh, in the moment. For example, uh, in aviation, in heating, we need to assume probably that if we look at all the sectors that will not have enough hydrogen available for their purposes, how do we make the prioritization work out in social terms? How can we organize and plan this prioritization? Now, that's a good question. I don't think that is criticism. I think that is a perfectly justifiable question, to be honest. Anyone who plays with energy scenarios, or perhaps I should start somewhere else, energy 
supply and demand is very complex. We're not only looking at decarbonisation, the power sector. We're not only talking about having as many e-vehicles as possible on our roads. We're talking about reducing energy consumption. We're talking about the building sector and so forth. There's shipping, there's aviation, there's every, everything. But if you look at our scenarios, you will see very clearly that the priority for the next, I'd like to say, 10 years, but unfortunately, we only have seven years until 2030, or perhaps six and a bit. The priority very clearly lies with renewable energy and greater energy efficiency. We can't avoid that if we want to achieve those targets. What we're looking at with the climate conference at the moment, and with our net zero roadmap that we revised and published two weeks ago, what we're trying to achieve with that is that the use of renewable energies needs to be tripled globally and energy intensity needs to be doubled. And I'm completely on your side when we talk about reducing energy demand is a huge, a crucial issue. As we always say, it's the first fuel for a successful energy transition. But how we can set priorities, that's a difficult question. There's no clear answer to that. There's something we can do with analysis because we can look at competitiveness and we can look to see which technology options exist and how different topics, different industrial sectors are doing at the moment. We can analyze all this and it's right, it's important to do that. It's always an important point in people's decision making. That's why we set up scenarios so that we can inform people about ideal options, ideal factors. But of course, an energy transition can only work if it's inclusive. And that means that all the players in the energy sector need to be involved, all the users of energy at different locations need to come up with compromises, all in the interests of a successful energy transition as fast as possible for reasons of climate change, but also for reasons of guaranteeing our energy supply. So how we prioritize that, the scenarios will give you information, but ideally you will use those scenarios to have national debates about what is right for that country and what all the stakeholders in that society can agree about. Thank you very much, Mr. Gu. That's been a really fascinating analysis and interesting answers. And I'm going to say goodbye to you at this point. Before we come on to the next speaker, just a couple of technical points. A couple of participants have told us they have a fuzzy image on the stream. If you go, you can improve the video quality. You have a little cog down there, bottom right. I hope that helps you to improve. Now, I see the next speaker, Mark Antoine uh, Matsega, Director of the Center for Energy and Climate of the French Institute of International Relations, IFRI, IFRI. He's going to talk about hydrogen from a geopolitical perspective, resources, transportation, and security of supply. Go ahead. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be with you this morning, and thank you very much to Sven Rösner as well, and to his staff. Now, I'm going to be speaking French today. Timur spoke German, and so I think it's okay if I speak my own language and say something in French. And perhaps I could say something from a slightly more French perspective. France and Germany have got a great deal in common, but when it comes to energy, and hydrogen in particular, but they do have slightly different visions on some things, and we need to try to bring those points of view together. So I shall try to ensure that we can jointly develop an awareness of what is at stake and try to bring together the strategies of our two countries. So you were asking about the geopolitics of hydrogen. A lot of imagination has been unleashed on this new geopolitics of hydrogen that will replace the oil 
economy. We're certainly far from large scale trade of hydrogen or hydrogen derivatives globally. But to start off, I think it's very important to realize what we envisaged perhaps four years ago, let's say, as to our strategies and decarbonization pathways in Europe have changed somewhat, certainly against four years ago or two years ago. We needed to update that and adjust it. Our strategic and geopolitical environment has changed. It has, there have been enormous upheavals. Let me give you some examples. Today, Europe is an island of stability and mixed war zones, areas racked by instability. To the east, one thinks, of course, of Ukraine, but also in the south of Europe, think of Gaza, certainly, but there's also Libya, Syria, etc. It's a very problematic context. It's the worst geopolitical backdrop that we have ever had, I would say. Now, we all have to engage in this energy transition in this very negative context. And we can't just step on the accelerator. It's not just a question of stepping on the gas pedal, so to speak. We need to really think about the kind of adjustments it will bring about. Now, looking across the Atlantic, certainly things are more stable. We have our allies across the Atlantic, but also our major competitor. There was the shock of the Inflation Reduction Act. We need to look at that in positive terms, but let's bear in mind that we did not envisage the shocks that would affect us over the last few years, the election of Trump, the pandemic, inflation, the invasion of Ukraine, the destruction of Nord Stream, the Hamas attack. The can't really forecast what is coming, and that, I think, means that we need to be enormously cautious. We need to take stock and regroup strategically, and we need to be very careful about entering into new dependencies. And the next point, which Timur also addressed, is inflation. Inflation is tending to become systemic. It was linked to energy imports, and it's now spilling over into the general economy. We certainly can't Imagine the kind of situation that we saw in the past for offshore wind farms and such like. We'll need to bear that in mind. The profit and inflation curve will look different. And there's also the question of imported hydrocarbons. Now, the prices are very high, and we're likely to see gas prices dropping a little over years to come. But we're going to have the transition with a high price per barrel for oil. A few years ago, we thought that imported hydrocarbons would not cost so much. That entirely changes the situation. It's tens of billions of euros flowing abroad and therefore lacking for investment in our economies. We need to move rapidly away from hydrocarbons and wean ourselves off them because we really have a problem with hydrocarbons. There's the question of ramp up for renewables, for the wind farm sector, for example. We have the we lack sites to establish renewables, for example. There's permit problems everywhere. We're trying to speed ahead, but we're not really managing to make headway. So we've had dependence on the gas front, certainly, to Gazprom. We paid 25 to 30 billion euros per annum previously, but with the gas that we purchased from Gazprom, we produced finished products and added perhaps 10 to 20 times value, and Russia was not a competitor in most of the goods that we produced, with a few exceptions. Nowadays, though, things have changed. We're buying enormous amounts of gas from the US, 
and there a direct competitor on almost all of the goods that we produce. We're likely to boost our dependency in the Middle East, and of course countries in the Middle East are increasingly competitors on all of those products as well. There's one thing that I think is absolutely vital to bear in mind as well. You see it if you look at metals as well. Most countries that hold resources don't want to simply provide resources. They want to move up the value chain and create employment in their countries and capture a great deal more value added. We'll see it with hydrogen as well. There are countries that could be exporter countries, but they will very rapidly realize, as is already the case in fact, that they would be better advised to do all they can to attract industry to their country and consume hydrogen as the derivatives on the spot. There's one thing that I think that we need to bear in mind. The EU plus the UK are the major losers in these crises. And these crises are going to persist in the long term. Our discussion as to our foreign policy strategy for hydrogen, our external trade policy for hydrogen has to take that on board. Now, before we start talking about large scale strategies for ambitious imports of hydrogen, we need to get to grips with underlying challenges. There's the question of the electricity network in Europe. We're not managing to boost deployment of renewables, nor are we managing to boost our networks. So we should, should we need more interconnections on all levels? We have an electricity grid where there is much less capacity that can be guided. We have lots more intermittent energy, and it doesn't respond to demand. Electrification is moving ahead to Zulu. There's enormous scope to move to greater use of electricity in industry as well. I think that should be our priority number one. Our states, however, are in a poor situation in budgetary terms. The kind of financing that one could envisage before these crises is not really viable any longer given interest rates and the cost of sovereign debt. We are the only ones in Europe who are aiming for green hydrogen as our top priority. The rest of the world doesn't care about the color of the hydrogen. They just want to be efficient. In other words, they're only interested in the carbon content of this hydrogen. They don't worry whether they're using nuclear energy or renewables to produce the electricity used to generate the hydrogen. There's a real gap there, which I find very worrying. That's all the more worrying because we need to come up with global rules and regulations for certifying hydrogen initiatives are underway. If we want to lead the way on this front, we do need to really focus on, on the entire rainbow of colors and focus on the result and not on exactly how that result is obtained. In addition, we'll need to give thought to new dependencies that might arise in the hydrogen industry. That's the case for renewables. It's the case for electric batteries for cars. I haven't seen many people addressing this when it comes to hydrogen, certainly within our individual countries or across Europe. The Americans are well aware of this issue, though, as well. And I think it would be a positive development if Europeans could concentrate on this one last point that Timor raised as well. We need to realize that here there is an enormous challenge that we'll need to respond to. We're not lagging behind quite as much as on batteries, but China has really pressed ahead. The point is that we need to be able to use very high capacity electrolyzers. It's a learning process. It's probably alongside the gigafactories where we see real rejectionism of that in Europe. We need to realize what is at stake, whereas the Chinese seem to have really 
got ahead of us on this front. There are ecosystems that are being set up. There's a genuine political will to forge ahead here with Germany in the forefront. There is indeed a greater interest in hydrogen internationally. That certainly is the case. We need to have strong leadership, and we do see European industrial leadership here. That's positive and needs to be reinforced, but there are enormous challenges ahead of us. If you looked to the outlying areas of Europe and the surrounding areas, which are unstable or subject to major insecurity, we'll need to concentrate on what we can do when it comes to hydrogen imports, either through gas pipeline or hydrogen pipeline. There is real potential to the south of the Mediterranean and a little further as well, Mauritania, for example. And we need to think of ways to have pipeline transportation of hydrogen to Europe. But the question is, what time frame are we looking at? If you look at the rest of the world, Australia was mentioned previously. We certainly won't be looking initially at hydrogen. It'll be derived products such as methanol, ammonia, synthetic fuels. That makes perfect sense. But I would like to put a damper on this enthusiasm. We won't be seeing exponential import of ammonia. There are limits to this, and we won't be transforming ammonia into hydrogen. The yields would be much too low, and the cost would be much too high. So these are very significant niche markets. Countries such as Brazil, Chile, North America, the Middle East, Australia are well placed to produce this kind of product which we will need, particularly in the aviation sector. The potential, though, will be limited for other products as well, for methanol, for example, for synthetic fuels. Countries that have desert, sun, wind, access to ports, stable governments that will allow them to have capital costs that are as low as possible will do well. These are places where electricity can pr be produced very cheaply. And there needs to be water there as well. And those countries will really be the winners in the geopolitical world shaped by hydrogen in the next 15 or so years. But we need to bear in mind that having said that, there's the question of water, certification of water. If you take water that comes from a desalination plant, which uses electricity generated using fossil fuels, there will be a hitch as well. Furthermore, as I said earlier, these countries will be developing value-added chains on the spot. You can see that clearly in the Middle East. You can see it, for example, and specifically in Saudi Arabia and also in other countries. We will need clearly to ensure that there are skilled workers who are able to work with these products, which are highly unstable, they're dangerous, they're explosive. There's a huge deal to be done on the training front. That will be a challenge in both Europe and elsewhere. That will be a huge challenge in developing these value-added chains. I also want to draw your attention to another challenge for Europe. We run the risk of a dividing line running between areas which have a coastline and offshore wind farm. If you're industrialist close to the coastline and close to these offshore wind farms, you will have access to hydrogen and derivatives at a competitive price, whereas the interior, all of the landlocked countries, for example, or the areas that are, say, 200 kilometers away from the coast, will find that hydrogen will be more expensive. That added value will be a real industrial challenge. The only way to overcome that is to have a vision in which electrification must be pushed and supported to the utmost. We must focus not just on green hydrogen. We'll have to 
except hydrogen produced from natural gas using CCS, also from nuclear power and also modular approaches. Now, there are clear prospects for the future here. It would be possible to produce hydrogen from high temperature electrolysis. That's the only way to avoid that kind of fragmentation and dividing line to ensure that we have low carbon hydrogen right across Europe. We can keep industry right across Europe, not just close to our coastlines. Just by way of conclusion, to try to get some take-homes for you. First of all, decarbonization of electricity is vital. We'll need to have networks, we'll need to have electrification of industry, we'll need to make our networks more robust. Our debates on hydrogen have tended to forget all of the progress that can be made in electrification of industry. That must be the number one priority. It's a question of economic security, essentially. And that's where we can make the most headway in Europe. We need decarbonization of current uses of hydrogen. We talk about new applications. We've talked about heating. We've talked about mobility. To be quite frank, in my view, that's really immaterial at present. There are dreadful emissions linked to consumption and production of hydrogen from fossil fuel sources. So let's focus on that. That's already a huge challenge. Total Energy, Epsilon and others have done a great deal to try to move in that direction. And there certainly are offtakes there. There is demand. There is a business case. A few words as to the German import strategy, which we made public at the end of the year, I believe. Certainly, there's a whole host of countries around the world that one could work with. Let us, however, focus on giving public money to projects in countries where there is a real decarbonization strategy underway, where there's no use competition, and where there are genuine partners for Europe. Now, unfortunately, when you look closely at all of the countries that could come into play, in the light of these parameters, there are few that are left over, let's look at the area immediately around Europe, and of course, it's unstable. If it's unstable, then the rest of Europe is not stable. Hence, we need to focus on Europe's periphery to the east, to the south. That will be a challenge for the next 30 years, and we need to ensure that these countries are linked to Europe geopolitically, economically, in societal terms and political terms. We need to have a hydrogen policy that's focused as much as possible on projects, first of all, in Europe. We have to learn to do this as much as we can within Europe. And let's bear in mind that there is this enormous competition that is starting to take shape. The best way to get to grips with that is to make electrification our priority and to concentrate on using hydrogen for very specific utilizations. I absolutely agree with what Timir has said. Steel, certainly petrochemicals, potentially also support to the electric system here and there, but on a smaller scale, because it's all going to end up being very expensive. One last comment, if I may. There is huge potential in the long term for infrastructure projects for hydrogen to link us up to the south of Europe or Ukraine as well. There's the question of stockage and storage, but let's have electrical transmission lines on a large scale. I think there's genuine potential there. Electricity underpins everything. It's that aspect that needs to be borne in mind. That is vital if we wish to be efficient when it comes to ramp up of these hydrogen ecosystems. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much for listening. And I hope that our German friends have been able to follow thanks to the interpretation.
Thank you. Thank you very much for these fascinating comments. And we've got time for questions now from our chat. Now, you were talking about the idea that in Europe we should focus on domestic hydrogen production. There's not such potential for imports. So where should the electricity come from for this hydrogen generation? In Germany and in France, there's a gap, a shortfall when it comes to electricity. Well, Ms. Hubner, you're absolutely right about this. It's an enormous challenge. As I was saying, there is going to be a short of a flexible low carbon electricity. There's going to be a shortage in terms of expanding renewables. We have this permanent pressure against our nuclear industry in France and elsewhere. It's so absurd in the current situation. All of our competitors worldwide look at this and they really laugh their heads off because we're shooting ourselves in the foot. So to respond directly to your question, we need to really make headway on ramp up. Immediately, we need to save as much energy as we can. We shouldn't do that by closing down industry, but by measures to boost efficiency, to ensure transition to other forms of energy as well. Whenever possible, we need to provide funding support for that. I think everyone needs to realize, and the French need to realize this as well, that in France, we need to really massively ramp up our solar and wind industry. Even if we do have nuclear power and in Germany and elsewhere, people need to realize that without nuclear energy, it's simply not possible to move ahead. Otherwise, we'll end up without hydrogen, without electricity, and then industry will really be in a pickle. That's exactly what German industry is saying and what French industry is saying. The only ones, unfortunately, who haven't quite grasped this, unfortunately, is um, certain political circles. Well, I hope that will make headway on that. Yes, that was a call to avoid polarization in the EU, certainly. Now, another question, perhaps you can give us a brief answer. The situation is changing, of course, due to oil prices. However, the question is the economic feasibility of hydrogen projects is high on the agenda. Investment risk is also pronounced, as we heard earlier. How can you ensure that these projects are economically viable? How can you cut investment risk? Well, of course, you can reduce investment risk by ensuring that politics send out a clear message that this is part of the future energy system and is strategically important. Capacities will be required. That's the first thing. We have that already. What we need next, particularly in the context of inflation that we currently have, is the following. EU funding could be made available through the European Investment Bank with preferential rates for loans. In addition, we need a shorter time frame for planning when electrolyzers are constructed you have to move ahead rapidly. They're highly sensitive industries, but all of the planning work, the whole process of approval and permits must be speeded up because every month that goes by means you're losing money. That's the case for renewables, for the nuclear energy as well. It all needs to go through the regulatory process rapidly. The question is how will we be able to obtain cheap electricity? We need to finally move ahead with reform of the electricity market is complex and tricky, but by the end of the year, we really need to have made some progress on this. Otherwise, we'll simply be wasting too much time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for calling to the world of politics as well, Mr. Elmar Sega. And we have one further presentation this morning. That will be before we have our coffee break. 
and uh, I'm very glad to welcome Sarah Pisco. I can see her on my screen here. She is Director of Strategy, Policy and Communication uh, with uh, ENSORG, that is the European Network of Transmission System Operators for Gas. Mrs. Pisco will be talking about uh, hydrogen networks towards a European hydrogen infrastructure, question mark. Welcome, Mrs. Pisco. Good morning. I hope you can hear me well. And it is my real pleasure to um, uh, join the forum for the first time on behalf of ENSOC, European Network of Transmission System Operators for Gas. Um, this abbreviation is probably uh, the first one that I would need to depict uh, for you uh, today. Uh, and I hope that the interpreters uh, will follow me. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, um, my uh, role uh, today here is to represent uh, the knowledge accumulated since the implementation of the third energy package dated in, in the EU uh, from 2009. ENSOC was created uh, back then uh, in order to facilitate the cooperation of the European gas TSOs, transmission system operators, uh, who are responsible for safe and secure uh, delivery of the natural gas. And my role with the organization since I joined ENSOC seven years ago was to develop the pathway for our transition from the natural gas um, uh, transportation towards transportation of hydrogen, bimethane, and also to prepare ourselves for the CCUS that might come. Uh, my uh, presentation today contains um, uh, four information that I think would be relevant for status update on what is happening uh, within the EU. Thank you very much, uh, Timur and uh, Marc Antoine, for uh, the morning presentations that gave us really global picture. Uh, and um, uh, uh, I think my presentation would be a level uh, deeper down in, in details when it comes to um, uh, the EU perspective. And since ENSOC is tasked to develop this transition and to serve this transition uh, for to towards hydrogen economy with quite some regulatory tasks that are put on us. Um, uh, I will be giving you first the status update and next I will move to some of the pleas and some of the principles that we would like to still uh, take with us further as the good lessons learned uh, from the practitioner's point of view, from the implementing implementation point of view that we believe still could serve well this transition and that could help Europe to achieve the efficient um, uh, hydrogen grids in the future. So if I can ask on my next for my next slide, I am here because the gas grids do allow for efficient transport of major volumes of energy. It is undisputable that we will definitely need to um, uh, augment the electricity grids, triple, quadruple, maybe even the capacities that we have on electricity side right now. And it is uh, evident that this, uh, our colleagues in our sister organization here in Brussels and SOE, um, Transmission System Operators for Electricity, are hardworking to expand and to prepare on their side. However, we believe that uh, uh, volume-wise, the energy that today uh, gas grids can transport can be also efficiently used in the future for hydrogen. Now, this process is, of course, uh, different than the one that we uh, experienced from, from gas. We are in the status of really starting the energy and starting the grids planning uh, for the uh, demand that we do not necessarily know exactly right now, uh, and we need to be in a demand-driven situation. However, we believe that Europe is lucky to have the grids already that could be um, uh, efficiently repurposed and put forward in the service of this transition. So the pipelines do support then uh, the decarbonization of industry. We were discussing this morning shipping and aviation that would need to have the energy available uh, 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 to them as those sectors that would be hard to abate uh, differently. So the molecules would be needed to be delivered. 
Uh, and we believe that also the future energy system will require quite a lot of interdependencies between the two grids, electric grids and molecule grids. It is because the electric system uh, right now will require a very smart siting and sizing of electrolysis in the system. And we believe that although we are maybe in a scarcity of renewable electricity right now, um, we also need to prepare to intermittency that comes with the production of greater amounts of the solar and of the wind energies. And uh, at some points we will, and in some places in the system, we'll also um, uh, experience the curtailment of energy that wouldn't be otherwise be able to use if the grids on the electricity side are not able to uh, acquire those um, produced uh, amounts. So we believe that interdependency between the gas and hydrogen uh, um, uh, infrastructure infrastructure and the way they could support uh, the electricity system are there to capture the potential synergies that also hydrogen storage could play in the future. With uh, speaking about repurposing of gas infrastructure towards hydrogen, I can only um, uh, 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 encourage uh, to uh, look into the benefits that this process may bring for the transition for Europe. Uh, we um, quantified as the European TSOs the high societal benefits that reusing of the existing grids can bring in terms of cost economies. Uh, it is um, one third of a cost of um, uh, the investment uh, comparing uh, when we repurpose uh, 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 an existing uh, pipeline or where we are thinking about building some new connections. So that is a high, uh, let's say, uh, release uh, on the economic cost of the transition, we believe. Also, what the repurposing is offering is the speedier transition. It is the fact that uh, transmission, the line projects usually require quite lengthy permitting processes nowadays. And the right of way that the European TSOs for gas hold right now that could be reused for the hydrogen speeds the processes much efficiently, more efficiently than um, uh, uh, building uh, all those grids from the scratch. So that is also a big um, uh, advantage of the repurposing agenda that we are preparing for in ANSOC. And last but not least, we said uh, heard today that um, uh, the connection between the clusters of hydrogen, where uh, they would start maybe locally, would need to be thought through and designed from the beginning. It is because those clusters will struggle with the um, uh, compliance with additionality rules if they do not have the supply from several sources. They will also uh, uh, benefit much uh, better if they would be cross-connected uh, and have access to the wider system for their security of supply. And that is a lesson learned from the uh, uh, well uh, interconnected gas market that we as TSOs can bring that those interconnections uh, uh, really enhance the security of supply of, of, of molecules. On my next slide, um, uh, I'm um, showing you the map of the hydrogen infrastructure that we as ENSOC produced together with all the transmission, storage, uh, LNG terminals uh, to be repurposed, and also the distribution operators in Europe. This map uh, is um, uh, available publicly and is updated every six months in order to understand where the location of the closest infrastructure project is um, uh, um, uh, available for the market participants. It also illustrates how much grids could be repurposed. It is simply color coded for the user. I invite you to play with, with this map. Uh, to, uh, in order to understand how many grids could be repurposed, where we would need to think about the mm -hmm. new connections. One thing about this map is that it depicts um, 300 infra projects. It, we also teamed up uh, with uh, the rest of the value chain to also understand here 
uh, and visualize the production centers and consumption centers in Europe in more depths. Each dot on this map is uh, the one that you can zoom in, zoom out, you can learn about the project and you have project promoters con uh, contact details there. Uh, and uh, this um, uh, overview uh, is created to understand for us the progress on the project site and the projects that the project consortia uh, are making in order to get to the stage of their final investment decisions. What is a little bit uh, maybe alarming is that right now we only have 2% uh, of FIDs, uh, this um, uh, decisions, necessary for the infrastructure projects to progress. Um, that is why, as ENSOC, we took on ourselves the role to monitor the progress of those projects, and we um, uh, definitely concentrate on our regulatory task. Apologies, I need to ask you for the next slide so that the map is visible to all the participants. Um, Thank you. Uh, and that uh, we can uh, also say that the progress on those uh, projects is um, also documented via the 10 year network development plans at the EU level with, in which ENSOC, my organization, uh, is working together with all the project promoters for hydrogen. We collected 2015 investments last uh, edition of TYNDP. And the uh, uh, majority of those projects and only those projects uh, that would be compliant with the EU trans energy network legislation would be able uh, to uh, speed up the preparation for hydrogen uh, infrastructure. Those projects are fully uh, uh, assessed and compliant with the renewed policy requirements for the hydrogen project promoters. Um, and also ENSOC is transparently consulting all our assumptions and also all our work for those projects to be properly prepared for the European Commission's and member states' decision on preparing for them for a speedier uh, mm, uh, mm, promoting for achieving for those projects the status of the so-called PCI pro, uh, uh, common of uh, European interest project of common European interest. On the next slide, I'm giving you uh, the um, uh, status info on what we as ENSOC are supposed to deliver and what we are delivering on uh, the uh, existing legal basis for gas and hydrogen and also for trans-European energy networks in Europe. So um, uh, as I mentioned, we are tasked to collect the project and to prepare them for the assessment by the European Commission and the Member States within the framework of TYNDP, 10-year network development plan. But also we have uh, the task derived from 10E regulation uh, when it comes to assessing those projects and filtering them for their um, uh, uh, via the indicators uh, illustrating for us their security of supply contribution, their market integrity uh, 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 contribution, and we are also assessing how much the projects candidating uh, for the 10 year network development plan and for the status of the project of common interest can contribute to um, uh, 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 eliminating the missing invest investment gap, the missing capacity uh, gap. We therefore are tasked to prepare the CBA cost benefit analysis and ENSOC has lately uh, prepared the first ever um, uh, hydrogen uh, um, CBA methodology for assessing the projects transparently with the same uh, type of indicators for the member states to be able to take the comprehensive uh, decision on our awarding the PCI status to those projects that will fulfill the CBA, positive CBA uh, uh, test. And we capture via this methodology the interdependencies and synergies uh, linked to the repurposing of hydrogen of, of gas infrastructure to hydrogen. This methodology depicts the um, uh, interdependencies between 
electricity needs, uh, gas projects security of supply to be maintained at all time while repurposing to hydrogen uh, projects. I invite you also to uh, uh, to contact NSOC in case of any questions on those. On my next slide, uh, I'm moving to the uh, uh, overview of the work uh, that my team has uh, uh, done under the umbrella of the European Clean Hydrogen Alliance. The alliance, as you may uh, uh, well know this, is uh, grouping right now uh, over 1,000 companies from Europe. And uh, alliance is divided into the roundtables that uh, represent the respective parts of the value chain. It is my pleasure to, uh, for the third year now, uh, uh, facilitating the work of the transmission and distribution uh, roundtable of this alliance. So what we've done last year, uh, we have uh, uh, prepared a learnbook on early info of uh, the hydrogen supply corridors uh, in uh, the way that they were indicated in the Repower EU plan announced by the European Commission. And we collected all the info available from the member states, from the industry and from all of the stakeholders around the corridors that the European Union wanted to establish. As you can see, they mainly all land in uh, Franco German area, uh, in main, mainland of, of Europe. And all the arrows represented here are representing the corridors and the uh, efforts of uh, preparing the uh, corridors for connecting the potential uh, supply uh, centers, North Wind from North Sea and from Baltic region, Southern Sun from uh, Iberian Peninsula, also including the potential imports from uh, Africa, as well as connecting them with the uh, uh, demand centers in the mainland Europe. We were discussing specificities of each of those corridors. And in order to address uh, the Repower EU ambition with as I said, quite a known uh, uh, market uh, and uh, uh, not fully represented demand yet. Uh, we discussed the barriers, but also the opportunities that those corridors ma may represent in the EU. Uh, what this report is also um, um, uh, presenting as the major advice uh, for this um, uh, route to design and execute in a sound and realistic, really realistic uh, manner, is to uh, decide on joint planning on gas and hydrogen site as soon as possible in order to design this in a secure uh, way and allow for the market ramp up mm -hmm. for hydrogen. And that the financing of this grid needs to be right now uh, uh, clearly on the agenda of both the, the countries supporting the production centers and those supporting the demand centers. I would like to say that uh, European Clean Hydrogen Alliance and our round table is uh, actively working on three more learn books in order to understand this as we go uh, with the project promote that journey towards uh, a successful projects. We are discussing the imports. How much uh, EU uh, would need to import is a debatable, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, of course. However, we have in our roundtable the ports that are also uh, uh, supporting the decarbonization of the shipping, but also of wider industries. And they need to prepare for the carriers like ammonia, uh, methanol. And in order to understand the scale of imports this autumn, we would uh, be um, discussing the imports uh, uh, under the new learn book to come. We are discussing uh, also the financing of the infrastructure. Uh, and I will have uh, a, a specific uh, more messages around this in a moment. And in a year time, we hope to look at all the implementation uh, that would be available uh, uh, to Europe, um, uh, because uh, this year we hope to have the regulatory framework with the uh, gas and hydrogen package in place. And we would be also after the first 
successful selection of the PCI uh, candidates, projects of common interest will be awarded by the European Commission and selected by the member states for further pro promotion and for further EU support. And in a year time, we will look into their implementation. So those learn books are uh, also constituting the best available information that we could uh, in NSOC uh, collect from stakeholders and uh, discuss with stakeholders in order to have this realistic picture of the corridors. Now I would finish maybe my updates uh, part for you and I would now move uh, uh, to the part on, one, on my next slide related to those principles that um, uh, we would like to share uh, as lessons learned from the gas site and that we still believe could make sense in the future for the hydrogen uh, infrastructure uh, to be de developed, be rooted on. So um, I think right now what we need for the, uh, for the infrastructure in the EU is first and foremost, the predictable regulatory framework this will all be offered by gas package. And I'm discussing here some of the key principles that we believe uh, could be valuable uh, for, for this final stages of the discussion on the package. So first on NSOC side, we believe that uh, we need to uh, understand the roles of the, uh, of the value chain and uh, try to have clear definition of, of what the transmission of hydrogen will be like and what the local dimension, local distribution of hydrogen uh, could look like. We would like to uh, uh, use uh, um, this um, lesson learned from the, from the gas uh, side to uh, underline that we need to avoid market fragmentation. We know that the natural development of hydrogen would be in clusters, so maybe in local contexts. However, we cannot call them only geographically confined. We should connect them as soon as possible in order to, what I said before, the, uh, deliver to them the so much required security of supply and interconnectivity that will allow the first users to take as soon as possible the advantages of the uh, wider market and the contact of the maybe stronger price forming signals that would be uh, available when they will be connected, not to one pipeline only, but to a wider system. So the first principle would be to avoid market fragmentation. Uh, what we are also uh, discussing with our members is that they do form the consortia of projects. It is of crucial importance right now to use this de-risking de of projects technique that uh, the uh, consortium is a little bit, a little value chain experience so that you have the project promoter for uh, production teaming up with uh, the, the infrastructure and with the uh, uh, off taker. However, what we also um, uh, see as the relevant lesson to bring here to, to government's attention is that the mm, infra access should as soon as possible, as soon as those first projects will kick in, uh, be also based on non-discriminatory third party access rule. This is the key principle that is creating the level playing field for the hydrogen uh, users. And that is the, the, the rule that uh, for the fully regulated uh, business as the uh, natural monopolies are and as the uh, hydrogen networks most likely will be is uh, uh, worthwhile, is the, the principle that is worthwhile uh, underlying here and remembering about designing the frameworks and equipping the national regulatory authorities to monitor this access to the third party access based infrastructure as soon as possible. Sorry, Sarah, also, I have to have What to I'm discussing in. here in more depth in a moment Sorry. is the joint planning for gas and hydrogen. Sorry, I mentioned the me? abbreviation of TYNDP, 10-year network development plan at the EU level. I would like to also uh, uh, integrate this thinking with the national development plans. It is important to also be able to see the local synergies that the proper siting and sizing of electrolyzers on the electricity system will have 
on the uh, uh, planning for the hydrogen and also what will be the effect on the existing gas grids when it comes to uh, repurposing uh, of the grids to hydrogen in order to uh, 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 maintain the security of supply for all molecules and also for electrons at all times. Therefore, this integration Sarah, between the operators of electricity, gas and hydrogen will uh, literally play uh, a coordination function, a really important role to be kept together and to exchange with each other, as we see in many Sarah. member states happening informally, but now we are formalizing on this one. Also, what we uh, uh, would like to um, um, uh, underline here is that we need to pre prepare for the scale of uh, the markets mm -hmm. to come for biomethane hydrogen carriers and CCUS, and we also need to understand how the grids potentially could look like in the future. And on my last slide, I'm discussing uh, the points that are, if I can ask you for the next one, I'm discussing the, the de-risking of the investments. As we believe in NSOC, it is the moment for really having the proper discussion around uh, the tarification of the grids. Um, uh, we believe that the uh, mechanisms that are being discussed in the EU, like the uh, potentially mandatory zero auction premium uh, at, at the interconnection points um, is a uh, um, potentially nice looking instrument, uh, but it is in, in fact rather removing the cost transparency that is so much required by the first movers um, in the cross-border uh, context, it is relevant to have the clear trans uh, 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 tariffs set out in uh, the borders of the member states so that they can definitely uh, explain to their users how the costs of the grids are supported by a given member state and how they work within a context of cross-border uh, connection. I think what is also important uh, principle is that any cost mutualization require a lot of monitoring by the NRAs, by the national regulatory authorities. So in order to support NRAs in this decision making, when the market scale is not exactly uh, entirely clear uh, for the NRAs to be able to approve the investments, it is important to understand a clear process for the cost mutualization between hydrogen users now and in the future. Uh, the uh, last point that I would like to make, and it is really my last one, is uh, mindful of a time. I would like to stress, and I will never stress it uh, enough, is the uh, need for coordination between uh, different players and different parts of decision making for those grids to happen. The design of the auctions uh, supporting the production uh, side in the EU puts the uh, obligation of uh, the um, uh, uh, taking care of the physical delivery of commodity on the off taker. That means that we as the TSOs team are teaming up with the uh, uh, off takers of the molecule. And it is of crucial importance to understand how the grids are connected to the industrial policy because industry will be our major first off taker. So there is never enough of, uh, of coordination that could happen there between the energy, the climate and the grow uh, perspectives in the EU. This is all supported by the work that ENSOC is doing in order to understand also the financial aspects of, of uh, this coordination, where, as I said before, uh, coordinating with stakeholders the preparation of the financial learn book that uh, would uh, also illustrate what is the financing for infrastructure available at the EU level at the national level from the public and private lenders. And we hope that with, that will that work will uh, support the project promoters in order to understand their uh, uh, the financial options and also be compliant with uh, 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 state aid rules in place in the EU. With these words, I would like to thank you very much for the attention and for the time uh, spent with ENSOC, with my uh, very detailed uh, uh, deep dive into the EU legislative and financing framework, and I'll be happy to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Desara Pisco, and please stay with us after the coffee break at 
11.30, we will continue on the fascinating issue, hydrogen as key to the EU's climate-neutral industrial future. And we're going to hear a keynote from the DG Energy at the European Commission and a rather interesting panel discussion. Back at 11.30, thank you.